Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. Today we've got a UFC 252 preview and predictions. It is finally time. Stipe Miocic taking on Daniel Cormier for the third time. It is happening for the heavyweight title of the world. Also, we've got Sean Sugar Sean O'Malley in the co-main event of this one taking on Marlon Vera. And we've also got a really intriguing top 10, top 5 heavyweight matchup between the former champion Sagano, Junior Dos Santos, and Jarzinho Biggie Boy Ruse Strike. Let's get straight into it here with a featherweight bout between TJ Brown and Daniel Chavez. But folks, if you have not yet, make sure to hit that subscribe button down below for more UFC. It just helps out the channel. Just hit that subscribe button down below and leave a like on the video. So let's start here in the featherweight division with TJ Downtown Brown and Danny Chavez. Let's start with Danny Chavez. So this is going to be his first fight in the UFC. Just fought less than a month ago over at Global FC. Won their featherweight title. Now he gets a really quick turnaround here against TJ Brown. Stylistically, this is a real fun matchup because Danny Chavez, man, really going to look for the knockout. Um, you got a guy in TJ Brown who isn't bad on the feet. Either we're going to talk about TJ Brown in a second here, but Danny Chavez, of course, the main strong suit for him is going to be in the stand-up. He's going to look for that knockout. I mean, that's how he usually wins fights. His last win by knockout in the first round, two minutes in before that. 2018, took a year off, but in 2018, um, at XFN, won by a head kick. And then before that, um, at Shogun Fights, won in 2018 with the knockout as well. His last loss was in 2016, so it's been a while. Lost back-to-back -back fights, but since then, since his return in 2018, won two fights, and then, of course, did win his last fight over in Global FC to win the championship. Of course, this will be his first ever fight in the UFC, taking on TJ Brown. So, of course, TJ Brown is amazing on the ground. That's basically where he wants most of his fights. He wants them on the ground. He wants to take this fight down, and he wants to win it, especially because Danny Chavez is a better striker, striker in my opinion, compared to TJ Brown. But TJ Brown can also uh, hold his own on the feet, but he's definitely better um, on the ground than he is standing. Um, last fight for TJ Brown. First fight in the UFC, they give him Jordan Griffin, a guy who's fought a lot of big names in the UFC, such as Dan Ige before. And yeah, Jordan Griffin won that fight in the second round by Guillotine. His first ever fight in the UFC, you get Jordan Griffin. Not an easy matchup at all. Um, got in the UFC by, be by beating Dylan Lockhart um, on the Contender Series, won by Arm Triangle in 2019, and then got his way in the UFC. That was one year ago, so he's gonna, one year after winning the Contender Series, he's gonna get a second fight in the UFC against another. UFC newcomer in Danny Chavez. Before that, um, came from LFA. So a lot of these guys you're gonna see LFA fighters and Cage Warriors are really like the. I personally feel like are the two biggest imports right now in the UFC. And yeah, beat Ken Beverly by a head kick. So TJ Brown does show he can also strike as well. But if you look at some of his finishes, right? CJ Hunter over in 2019, a pyramid fights, one by arm triangle, uh, GCF, one by head kick. So he's either going to really just kick you in a, into oblivion or he's going to get you to fall down. He's going to get a knockdown and he's going to finish the fight on the ground as well. So TJ Brown really has a lot of ways um, he can finish fights. His last loss was in 2018, but um, since then, man, his only loss before that, or his only like big loss since 2016 was against Bobby Moffat. Bobby, Bobby Moffat, another guy in the UFC, has been in and out, um, was on Dana White's uh, looking for a fight before. So yeah, TJ Brown, Danny Chavez, really interesting fight because I think TJ Brown can hold his own on the feet in this one, but he can, I mean, I think he's going to want to keep this one on the ground, but it could go, it could definitely go either way. So as a prediction in this one, um, I think Chavez is going to have a slight favorite. Uh, he's going to be the slight favorite if this fight stays standing. But on the ground, I think you got to give this one to TJ Brown. This dude knows how to finish fights. He can pass the full mount pretty easily, and he's going to be able to finish fights that way. That's how we can set arm triangle. Get into full mount, pass then to side. He's, that's how he wins fights. Um, and I, he can definitely hold his own striking as well. So we are going to go with TJ Brown to get the win in this one. He's finally going to pick up his first win here in the UFC. All right, we've got a real interesting matchup here, here at Featherweight. We've got Herbert Burns and we've got Daniel Pineda. If you've heard the name Daniel Pineda before, you probably know him from either his last run in PFL in 2019, or it's because he used to find the UFC. So he got his contract in 2012. He comes from LFA, is the LFA Featherweight champion, comes into the UFC, um, picks up a win, picks up two wins, then they give him Mike Brown, Brown gets the dub by unanimous decision, loses another fight, then wins a fight um, by Kimura against Justin Lawrence, then fights Diego Brandao, loses that one, fights Robert Whiteford, loses that, and then gets released 
from the company, goes back to Legacy FC, right, wins three fights there, gets the call to Bellator, loses his first fight there, then wins a fight, then loses another one, goes back to LFA, and then finds his way into PFL, uh, most recently in 2019. Um, yeah, he, he, he got popped. We don't know what he got popped for, but we know it was an illegal substance. So, coming off of those two technically wins in the PFL, right, but he got popped. Now is back in the UFC just like that. So it's kind of a crazy ride that Daniel Pineda is back in the UFC. Um, he can get a he can get a finish with strikes, get a finish on the ground. As you look at his two wins here in the PFL, um, one by knockout and the other one by guillotine. Right? I mean, he has multiple wins by submission and by knockout. Most recently, a lot more um, with submissions. But I mean, he's he's also got the knockout power as well to put guys down. But he fights Herbert Burns in this fight. Of course, Herbert Burns is the brother of top welterweight contender Gilbert Burns, right? But Herbert Burns is good everywhere, man. He's, of course, got amazing jujitsu, but he's also not bad on the feet either. His last win, UFC 250, beat Evan Dunham. And, you know, Evan Dunham's one of those guys, right? If you beat Evan Dunham, you kind of know, like, you're one of the guys down in the UFC, right? Because you pick up a win against a UFC veteran in Evan Dunham. His last fight, rear naked choke, made it look easy, did Herbert Burns. He's good on the feet, uses the clinch really well, can tie you up, Boom, used the Muay Thai, and that's how he won um, earlier this year in 2020. Won with the Muay Thai clinch. Boom, worked the knees to the body, and then boom, to the head. Herbert Burns is really well gifted everywhere, and it's kind of like Gilbert, too, because, I mean, if you look how we got in the UFC on the contender series, beat Derek Minner by a triangle choke early in the first round. In Titan FC, rear naked choke win in the first round. Then a triangle arm bar in Titan FC in 2018, his last loss. Had back-to-back -back losses uh, when he fought and won championship in 2017. And before that, um, was actually 5-0 in one championship as well. So Herbert Burns, man, really talented everywhere. Um, he's, you, you know, he's known for being on the ground. He's known for having great jujitsu skills, right? Of course, with the chokes. Um, that's why he beat Evan Dunham, right? But he's sneaky good on the feet as well. So you can't. Pass up on Herbert Burns here. Standing, I think he's going to be Daniel Pineda. I mean, I know Pineda got those two wins in PFL. He is on a really good five-fight winning streak, if or a six-fight winning streak, if you do include those two fights in PFL. But given the banned substances, I've got to give this one to Herbert Burns. He's on the way up. Daniel Pineda just finally getting back in the UFC. But it kind of feels like a guy they want to give Herbert Burns to slowly build Herbert Burns up to be a pretty big star. Because, of course, Gilbert is his brother. So Herbert Burns, I think, is going to get the win. Um... I think by stoppage, I think he's going to stop him on the ground by submission. Give it to Herbert Burns. Next up in the women's strike division, we've got Virna Jandradoba taking on Felice Herrick. Let's start with Virna Jandradoba. So, um, she wants to be on the ground, and she wants to be on her back. I mean, because she can find ways, arm triangle, arm bar on, on her back to win fights, right? Her last win was against Malroy Martin, won by Rune Choke on the Overeem, uh, Rusen Straight card in DC in December. Um, they gave her a fight against Carlos Sparza because she was coming into that fight against the Sparza, the Invica strawweight champion of the world. Um, can't come to the UFC 14-0. They, right off the bat, give her Carlos Sparza. A Sparza really just out-wrestled her, and it really was, Jandra Joba just really couldn't get um, a submission in, because the Sparza is so good on the ground, right? I mean, I think there's a chance Carlos Sparza is going to get a title shot. There's legit a chance right now with everyone hurt either her or Clyde Gadelia if Gadelia wants to think Gadelia is going to get it but Carlos Sparza top five name in the weight class they feed um Jan Chitoba to Carlos Sparza right away as Sparza wins but Jan Chitoba did win her last fight um in December by her naked choke Felice Herrick right is a really good wrestler I mean I wouldn't say well, okay maybe for the weight class she's a really good wrestler but She's going to try to take fights down. That's really how she's done it in her last couple of fights. She tried against Michelle Waters and lost that fight. Tried against Karolina Kovalkiewicz, lost that fight. But, you know, the UFC's given Felice Herrick some really big names, right? So she comes in the UFC, right? She was in the Ultimate Fighter show. Um, didn't do that great. She won her first fight and then lost to Randa Marcos. Um, her second fight, yikes. Um, so, right, her first fight in the UFC, other than uh, she fought Lisa Ellis on the Ultimate Fighter show. Then they give her a Paige Van Zandt, and she lost to Paige Van Zandt. Okay, I've talked about it before. I don't think Paige Van Zandt's that bad. Okay, I, I know she's not as good as Amanda Rebus. So she's not really a top 15 name. I mean, maybe at flyweight, she's like around 15. But, I mean, people kind of disregard Paige Van Zandt. She went five rounds to Rose Namajunas. All right, I know she's not great, but I'm just saying. She, um, so Felice Herrick loses to Paige Van Zandt. Then beats Kaylin Curran, beats Alexa Grosso. So that's a big win right there. Alexa Grosso is a really big win. Justine Kish. Then she beats Courtney Casey. So she's coming off a big win streak right here. Right here. Four wins. 
Then they give her Carolina Kovalkiewicz. She's coming off a couple losses. That's um, Carolina. Lost to Gedalia. Um, I think that's before the Andrade fight, but she lost to Gedalia. Um, uh, Joanna for the title. And then so they give Carolina and Felice Herrig a fight. Carolina barely wins that fight by split decision um, on UFC 223. Two, uh, that's Habib I. Quint, I believe. Yeah, it is. And then um, Herrig turns around in October, fights Michelle Watterson um, at UFC 229 and loses on Habib Connor. Um, Michelle Watterson gets the job done by any decision. Basically, Harry's gonna try to take fights down, and she's really, I mean, I wouldn't call her a wet blanket, but she kind of is. Um, she has, I believe, yeah, she has one stoppage in the UFC. It's her first fight by armbar, and really other than that, she goes to the decision. Um, she's not gonna finish fights, or actually, given she has two finishes, uh, she beat Kenneth Curran by Renee Kachoke. Um, but she's gonna try to take you down, she's gonna try to just hold position, honestly, for 15 minutes, four, three rounds, but... Virna Jandradova is really good at jiu-jitsu, so she kind of wants this fight to be on the ground, and I think she's going to beat Felice Herrick, okay? Uh, Felice Herrick, given she has some good wins, but look at her losses, all right? Her, she has some really good losses, too, though. Michelle Warson, Carolina Kovalkiewicz, two top 15 names. Paige Van Zandt, I, again, not, I mean, Paige Van Zandt's not great, but she's not bad either, and Tisha Torres in Invoca, right? So, I mean, not bad losses at all. Carlos Sparza way back in the day, too, um, at XFC in 2011, so that's a long time ago as well. Uh, Random Marcos, if you count, tough, but yeah, um... I think Jandra Dobe is going to be able to win this fight. Former Invicta Strawweight Champion of the World comes into this fight um, on a one-fight winning streak. Lost to Carlos Barza, but her jiu-jitsu is really good, and I think Felice Herrick really can't compete with that. So we are going to give the win to Virna Jandra Doba. All right, we've got two big heavyweights here, and Christopher Dawkins and Parker Porter both making their UFC debut in this one. Let's start here with Parker Porter. So, of course, first fight in the UFC. Um, last fight was in 2019 in CES. Wins by knockout. Both these guys, man, really good at getting knockout finishes. But Parker Porter, man, um, two fights ago, one by Kimura. I mean, it's not often you see heavyweights who are really good at jujitsu, other than, I mean, Fabricio Verdum, Alexi Olinick. Guess Dan Cormier too, but I mean, okay, I'm not comparing Parker Porter to any of those guys, but I'm telling you, it's in it's in his book. He knows how to get submissions. Americana, back in Bellator in 2015. He did fight in Bellator. He got two fights, lost his first one to Josh Dykeman, and then won his second against Eric Bedard. Um, that was in 2015, though. Since then, took three years off from fighting, beats J.A. Dudley in 2018 at Reality Fighting, wins in the third round by knockout. Given J.A. Dudley at the time had a record of 8-17, and 17, so I don't know how much stock you could put in to that one fight after fights keith bell in 2018 at ces um loses but did he really lose he lost because illegal shots in the back of the head he had that fight won in the first round but he did end up getting the dq loss and then uh kevin sears will by kimura and then won his last fight by ko in 2019 so he finally gets the call up here against christopher Dawkins. um should be an exciting one because P parker or parker porter yeah um has shown that he can get submissions and if christopher Dawkins, right who given is not a bad wrestler we're going to talk about christopher um Dawkins in a second here not a bad wrestler at all so it's going to be interesting clash of styles here so that's Parker Porter, really. Um, he's currently standing in at a record of 10-5. Former um, Bellator fighter, went 1-1, one one, now gets a, shot, gets a shot in the UFC against Chris Dawkins. So Chris Dawkins' last fight in 2019 in CFFC won by knockout in the first round, early knockout against Danny Holmes. Problem is, Danny Holmes has a record of 4-4. Four four. A lot, both these guys, Dawkins and Porter, really fighting guys who aren't, I mean, don't have the greatest of records here, but nothing less, they're here in the UFC. Um, two losses on the record. Um, um, one in CFFC, in the, or two actually in CFFC, one against Azuna Awanu, a uh, former UFC fighter, I do believe, right? Um, yeah, loses that fight by KO in the second round. Um, of course, Chris Dawkins is probably going to come out and try to swing for the fences here and try to get a knockout. But his wrestling is not bad either. So if you see Parker Porter try to take this fight to the ground, I think Chris Dawkins should be able to stuff that takedown, stop from going to the ground. I think he should be able to keep this fight standing. Um, because one of his losses um, is by Americana. I mean, that's back in 2015, but still something to note. Not much on both these guys, right? Both making the UFC debuts. I mean, not many fights for both of them. Dawkins has 11. Um, Porter has 15. Both in promotions that aren't as well known. Um, of course, Porter does have two in Bellator, but still not two well-known fighters here. It's really just to pick them in this fight because I, really no one knows how this fight's going to end. Of course, you've got to expect a heavyweight fight. Both these guys are really just going to try and throw. But of course, we've seen that Porter does have the ability to get takedowns and work work in the clinch as well. 
But Doc is, is not bad with his takedown defenses at all as well. So as a prediction, I mean, really could go either way. I'm going to go with Chris Doggis to get the win. What I've seen out of Doc is I like a little bit more than Parker Porter. But I mean, if Porter wins, he definitely could. This fight could really go either way. But for now, we are going with Chris Dawkins. Back here at Strawway, we've got Ashley Yoder taking on Lavinia Souza. Let's start here with Ashley Yoder. So fought a lot of good fighters in the UFC, right? Comes to the UFC um, on Louis Ab Abdurakimov, loses to Justine Kish by unanimous decision. Then fights Angela, Angela Hill, loses by unanimous decision. Then they give her Mackenzie Dern. Dern beats her by split decision. Gets another shot in the UFC, though. Wins against Amanda Cooper um, on the Yair Rodriguez and Zombie card. Then what's another fight against Siri Kondo um, over on Moicano and Korean Zombie. And then her last fight, split decision, lost to Random Marcos. Ashley Yoder, I mean, she's just, like, decent everywhere. That's really the best I can say about Ashley Yoder. Um, given, right, you can't take her losses that, like, you can't put too much stock into it because they're really good names. So you look at her record, 7-5, and five, you're like, oh, well, I mean, she's just a middle-of-the-road fighter, maybe even below that. But, I mean, the losses, Justin Kish, I mean, I wouldn't say a proven name, but, I mean, a decent name, right? Fought in the UFC. Angela Hill, looking like maybe a top 10 fighter right now in 15. Uh, Mackenzie Dern, yeah, I would say top, top 10, top 15 as well. Beat Amanda Cooper, wouldn't say top 15, but still beat Amanda Cooper. Brandon Marcos, I would say potentially looking at a top 15 as well. So Ashley Yoder um, lost a lot of good names. Two wins in the UFC, four losses. Um, came from Invoca, had one fight there, beat Amber Brown by submission there. Um, yeah, but she gets Lavinia Souza in this one. Lavinia Souza is pretty good everywhere. So the former Olympian in judo, Lavinia Souza, her last fight against Brianna Van Buren is very interesting. If you know who Brianna Van Buren is, she is a really good wrestler. I would go as far as saying maybe top five in her weight class. I mean, you got Carlos Barza, Brianna Van Buren is a really damn good grappler. Um... Lavinia Souza lost to Bianca Van Buren. So it was really judo versus wrestling. Who was going to win? Bianca Van Buren got the job done by unanimous decision over in Sacramento. I believe that was Bianca Van Buren's first ever fight in the UFC. Before that, um, Souza has fights such uh, with a name such as Angela Hill. That's her only loss in Invoca. Split decision 2016. Um, that, I believe, yeah, that was for the Invoca Strawweight Championship of the World. Yes, it was. Um, yeah, lost that fight by split decision. Really close fight over in 2016. Um, comes in the UFC. Gets Alex Chambers first, pretty easy. Gets gets a hold on her, pushed her back against the clinch, takes the fight down, works into full mount, and gets the job done by Guillotine on top. So Souza's jujitsu is really good. Her judo is really good, getting that fight to the ground. She works pretty well in the clinch as well. I mean, all signs in this fight, all signs are pointing to a Lavinia Souza win in this one. That's where I'm going because Ashley Yoder, man. I mean, I know her losses are not that bad. Angela Hill, um, Mackenzie Dern, Justine Kish, Random Marcos, solid names. But Lavinia Souza, 13 and 2, uh, a loss against Brianna Van Buren. I mean, Brianna Van Buren is just so good. She's so gifted wrestling. That's really all she came from. That background was she's coming from a wrestling background. That really is what she does in a fight. Go watch the Tisha Torres Brianna Van Buren fight. It's a real interesting fight. Tisha Torres won, but Brianna Van Buren had her moments in that one as well. But. Um, Lavinia Souza did lose that fight. She just really couldn't do anything against Brianna Van Buren. And the Angela Hill fight was close too as well. So I think, yeah, everything's pointing to a Souza winning this one. I think she's going to beat Ashley Yoder. I'm going to say she wins by decision, but she could definitely finish this fight as well. But for now, we are going with a decision win for Lavinia Souza. All right, so rounding out the prelims, this is a fun fight. Vince Pichel taking on Jim Miller. Let's start here with Vince from hell, Pachelle. His last fight won by unanimous decision over Roosevelt Roberts. Before that, fought Gregor Gillespie, but Gregor Gillespie was on a big run for a damn long time, and Gregor Gillespie won that fight over Vince Pachelle on the Rivera Morais card over in New York in 2018. But before that, got a good win over Joaquin Silva, beats Damian Brown before that by knockout, and then yeah, comes in the UFC, loses his first fight, but then gets on a roll. Um, Vince Pachelle, he's gonna throw. He's just gonna throw. He's gonna try to knock you out. Um, how we got in the UFC, of course, was the Ultimate Fighter. Remember they did the Ultimate Fighter live? I'm gonna keep it real. I don't know why I don't remember a single thing about that season. I, I just don't. It was Dominic Cruz and Faber. The thing is, I think this is why. Uriah Faber was co was coaching, of course, against Connor. That was a very memorable season because, of course, Connor McGregor made that a really fun season. And then, of course, you have the Alpha Male season. You've got um, Cody and TJ, and Uriah was in that season so much as well. So that's why I think the um, the the Dominic Cruz and Uriah Faber season like does not stick with anyone's memory because you remember the Uriah Connor season and you remember the Alpha Male season. So that's why I honestly don't remember too much about the season. But um, I Vince Michelle lost on um, the semifinals 
to Ally Quinta, Raging Ally Quinta, former title challenger technically in Ally Quinta. I Quinta won that fight by unanimous decision, but to get to that point, uh, Pichelle won his first two fights by submission, then beats Chris Saunders by majority decision to get to that fight against Ally Quinta, but then loses. But uh, and then he lost on the Ultimate Fighter show as well, but then came back, won a couple fights. Now, since since his first loss in the UFC, has only lost one fight, and it's to Gregor Gillespie, so this is fun. Vince Pichelle, this fight given is probably going to win Friday night because these two guys are going to throw. We're talk, we're going to talk about Jim Miller in a second here, but I mean, you kind of know what you're going to get out of a Jim Miller fight, but Vince Pichelle, look at his fights. He just throws, and he's going to try and knock you out, and that's pretty much the end of the story. Let's talk about the UFC veteran, the all-time leader in fights. That's Jim Miller. Well, I went against him in his last fight. I was like, Roosevelt Roberts is definitely winning this fight against Jim Miller. I'm over on Blades Volkov, and damn was I wrong. Because, oh my goodness, Jim Miller with the arm bar. I mean, dude, you can't, you can't bet against this man. Like, Jim Miller finds ways to win fights. I mean, I, I let's go with, let's go through it. I, let's talk about, um, like, his big fights in the UFC, right? Comes to the UFC, wins two fights. They give him Gray Maynard, but that's before Gray Maynard was really big, fighting Frankie Edgar twice for the title, having a draw with Frankie Edgar. Amazing fight, by the way, go watch that. Um, yeah, uh, Jim Miller gets a win over, like, Dwayne Ludwig, um, Charles Oliveira, yeah, that's a long time ago. They give him Benson Henderson, loses that fight. Uh, Melvin Gillard wins that one. He fights Nate Diaz on a main event of a Fox car in 2012. Loses by guillotine, though. Um, beats Joe Lazone, really fun fight in that one. Uh, Pat Healy, uh, I think, yeah, he won that fight, or no, Healy won that fight, but then Healy was popped, I believe. Um, yeah. Um, beat Yancey Medeiros. He's fought Cowboy before, lost that one. Benil Dariush lost that. By the way, I'm recording this on Saturday night. Benil Dariush came through with that big spinning elbow or spinning back fist. What a fight, man. Benil Dariush is a beast. Top 10 names soon. Give me that Paul Felder fight right now. But, um, yeah. Uh, Jim Miller fights, guys, dude, Michael Chiesa, Diego Sanchez, beats Takanori Gomi, beats Joel Lazone, beats Diago Alves, lose to, then they give him Dustin Poirier, though, and, uh, uh Anthony Pettis, lose to Francisco Trinado, who that, tri Francisco Trinado, man, will not age, he beats Jai Herbert, oh my goodness, I think that was two or three weeks ago, that's the famous, stop the fight, fight with Dan Hardy and Herb Dean, you love to see it, um, loses to Dan Hooker, beats Alex White, they he fights Charles Oliveira again, loses this time around, um, this, now we're in 2018, but given, Jim Miller's been fighting. Like, it seems almost all the damn time. Beats Jason Gonzalez. Uh, beats Clay Guida. That was an interesting fight, right? Because in that Clay Guida fight, right? Um, I believe it's... Jim Miller got stunned, right? I, I always get, get this one mixed up. Because it was such a short fight, right? I believe Miller got stunned, right? At, to start the fight. Guida stuns him. But then Miller comes back. Boom! With the right hand. Doesn't drop Clay Guida, but stumbles him. So Guida's like, oh damn. Okay, I'm gonna go for a takedown here. Jim Miller instantly. Boom! Guillotine! locks down the body triangle as well and wins that fight. Guida goes out, so they give the win. Mean, of course, they give the win to Jim Miller. Then he fights Scott Holtzman, who just lost to Benil Dariush, loses by unanimous decision, and then most recently fights Roosevelt Roberts, Ro Roosevelt Roberts and gets the job done in that one. I picked Roberts, but what you gonna do, man? So, Jim Miller, Vince from hell, push shell. Oh my goodness, this is going to be an incredible fight because I expect these two dudes to stand in the middle of the octagon and they are going to throw. Jim Miller, man, 36 years old. Pichel, 37. But I mean, Jim Miller, how many fights has he had? But given, right, you can't dismiss Jim Miller's jujitsu skills. He's really good on the ground, too. And same with Vince Pichel, honestly. I mean, we're expecting this fight to be a stand up brawl, but both these guys know how to get it done on the ground as well. Um, for a prediction, though. It should be a real fun fight. Could go either way. I picked against Jim Miller last time against Roberts, and I'm not going to pick against him again. I, I feel like Jim Miller is going to get this one done. Definitely could go either way, though. I could see Vince Pichel definitely winning this fight as well. But I'm go Jim Miller, man. I, I mean, I'm just pissed. I missed that one against Roberts. I thought Roberts was going to have that one. Miller coming off a loss. Really fun fight against Scott Holtzman, but still loses that fight. I thought Roberts was on the way up. Just beat Brock Weaver in impressive fa uh, fashion. But I, no, Jim Miller was like, screw the hype. I'm going to get this job done. Vince Pichel, another older fighter, beat Roosevelt Roberts as well. So, I mean, both of these guys, last win, last fight was against Roosevelt Roberts. But we are going to go with Jim Miller to get the job done. I'm, I don't think he's going to stop him. I'm going to say this is going to be an all-out war for 15 minutes, three rounds. I'm so excited for this fight. And now it's time. It is time for the main card. All right, so I talked about how Jim Miller and uh, Vince Pichel could have the fight of the night. But, man, this could top it. We've got Magomed Ankalov taking on Jan Kutabella, and let's start first with how we got here. So the first fight was in Norfolk, Virginia, uh, Divas and Figueredo, and Joseph Benavidez won, right? 
These two dudes at the weigh-ins are all into it, of course. Jan Kutubella has the whole Hulk thing, so he's all in green. Mago Med's hyped for this fight as well, but it's really Kutubella getting this one pumped up, right? They come out there, they're throwing off the bat, overhand right, overhand right, overhand right. Um, it, the, the reason the fight ended, it was early stoppage, but Jan Kutubella in this fight, he gets rocked, right? He gets rocked. There's no doubt about it, he gets rocked, but he kind of sells it in a way where he's trying to sucker Magomed to come in closer so he can land that straight right. So he's like doing crap with his head where he's looping around, looping around, like he's moving his head in circles. It's obvious that he's not out. It's obvious that he's trying to sucker him into something. So he's moving his head in damn circles. And really Magomed doesn't do anything else. Like he hits maybe, hits him with a jab, a left and a right, and the referee stops the fight. Really bad stoppage. And then after the fight, Kutubella and Magomed are like they want to fight again. It's wild. So this is why we are here um, like six months later now here for this fight for the rematch. Both the guys haven't fought since, but yeah, I just want to talk about that. That was the first interesting fight. That was an interesting fight. That first fight. Go watch it. It's on uh, Divas and Figueredo and Joseph Benavides number one in February. Okay, so let's start first with Jan Kutabella, the man who did lose that first fight, but did he really lose? I mean, yeah. I, I mean, Magomed caught him, but it was still a terrible stoppage. He was still on his feet, too. It, it was a bad stoppage. But, um, so gets that fight against Magomed because he beat Cleo Roundtree Jr. right before that. They gave him Glover Teixeira, which was kind of interesting, right? Because, I mean, given before that, he had a win over Henrique De Silva and Gazi Dimad and Tegilov. But it's like, dude, those two wins give you Glover Teixeira? I, I don't know about that. I mean, I think that was at a point where, right, where Teixeira was losing fights. Um, I think he just lost to Corey Anderson, if I do believe, right? And then that, that's how he got the Kutabella fight. But Kutabella lost that fight by, by rear naked choke. Teixeira took him down. His jiu was just way too good for Kutabella in the end. Before that, um, before this, that three-fight run that he got the Teixeira fight with, um, fought Jerry Cannoneer. That's when Cannoneer was still fighting at light heavyweight. Cannoneer did end up getting the job done, though, by unanimous decision. Comes in the UFC, beats Jonathan Wilson. And before that, first fight in the UFC, it's Misha Serkinov. Misha Serkinov is a very tough out in your first fight in the UFC. Kutabella... Amazing striking. That's all I can really say. He's going to stand. He's going to throw. I mean, it's going to be like the first fight, but it's going to be who can land first this time, Magomed or Jan Kutubel. But now let's talk about Mag Magomed and Kilov. So, only one loss ever. It's to Paul Craig. Paul Craig, man, really underrated submission skills with Paul Craig. Really underrated fighter and all. That was uh, Magomed's first fight in the UFC. Paul Craig does get the job done in 2018. Since then, wins a couple fights, beats guys such as Kilson Abreu. Then uh, gets the Jan Kutubel fight. I mean, we talked about it before. Fun fight. Magomed is an amazing striker as well. Um, you can't dismiss, of course, though. Um, Jan Kutabella does have a does have a gold medal in Sambo over in the... I believe it's just like a European championship. Jan Kutabella did win that, but he doesn't use a Sambo at all. He's just going to throw. So, I mean, you can really disregard the wrestling. It's like Justin Gagey. Justin Gagey was a D1 wrestler, but no one talks about that because he doesn't wrestle. So, Magomed, Jan Kutabella, it's going to be like the first fight. Who can land the big shot? And it's that simple. Really, I, I I wouldn't bet on this fight. I know Magomed won the first fight, and he did land some heavy shots to Kutubella to start it off, but it's not an easy fight to pick because that fight could have definitely ended up this, a different way. If Jan forces Magomed to come closer, boom, he gets him with a hook or something. He could have easily won that fight, and we could be talking about a different story right here with this fight. Um, it was a terrible stoppage. That's why we are doing this. Um, but yeah, prediction. I'm going to go with Magomed to get the win in this one. He only has one loss in his career, and it's because Paul Craig took him down and finished him. But this fight's not going to end up on the ground. Unless Kutubella comes out with a whole different style. He uses his Sambo to his advantage here against Magomed, which, I mean, with a smart game plan, it technically could be the best way to win this fight. But you know what we want to see. We want to see these two, two dudes slug it out to open up the main card here on UFC 252. I'm going to go with Magomed to get the win, though. Not really because we saw it before. It's just because overall, you look at the body of work Magomed has had. It's somewhat better than Kutubella, even though Kutubella has better names on his um, resume compared to Magomed. I'm going to go with Magomed and Kilov to get the win in this one. It should be a fun fight, though, no matter what. All right, this should be a good one. Over at Bantamweight, we've got John Dodson taking on Marab Divashili. Let's start with John Dodson. So, of course, comes in the UFC after winning the Ultimate Fighter, Bisbing and Miller won in the finale by beating TJ Dillashaw with a big knockout, winning knockout of the night in the process, and winning the the ultimate fighter and yeah comes into the UFC right goes down to flyweight gets Tim Elliott wins that Juicy Formiga wins that then they give him Demetrius Johnson loses that fight by unanimous decision I would say I think 49 46 I do remember 
if I, if my memory does serve me correctly then goes on another streak wins three fights because he went over John Moraga again in the process fought John Moraga before um before he made his way into the UFC they give him Demetrius Johnson again that fight wasn't even close so my mouse runs right through him um yeah then then he gets John Lineker when he goes back up to Bantamweight gets a main event spot in that one um in Oregon lost that fight really close fight but lost by split decision I mean you definitely could have called that fight for John Dodson I thought he won that fight but they ended up giving the decision to win to John Lineker then Dodson fights Eddie Wyland gets a win there then he gets Marlon Marais that's really before Marlon Marais was a top five top ten guy Marais barely wins that fight by by split decision then after um John Dodson gets a win over Pedro Munoz and Pedro Munoz right now top five guy in the weight class so wins that fight by split decision then fights Jimmy Rivera. Rivera wins that one by unanimous decision. Then Ja Dodson fights Peter Jan. So this is in February um, on Blakovich Santos over in the Czech Republic. All right. So John Dodson at this point, at this point of the fight, you know, or when when coming into this fight, right? John Dodson still like losing fights, but he hasn't won over Pedro Munoz. But at this point in time, that Pedro Munoz fight wasn't exactly too impressive yet. It's going to be because at this time, Pedro Munoz is scheduled to fight Cody Garbrandt, but he still doesn't have that win over Garbrandt. Once he gets a win over Cody Garbrandt, then that that fight, that win for John Dodson really sticks out. But at the, at this point in time, right? They're giving Dodson Peter Young. It's kind of a fight where Peter Young should win, and he does. He just dominates grappling, gets in the clinch, works back, takes him down repeatedly. That's really how Peter Young fights, but I mean, Peter Young's really good everywhere, but kept taking him down, taking him down, taking him down. John Dodson, though, he's so quick, though, with his hands. He's... He, I maybe I wouldn't say as fast as Cody, Gar Cody Garbrandt, but as soon as you break out of the clinch, or if the fight's on the ground and it stands back up, John Dodson's so quick he's gonna catch someone, and that's he caught Peter Yan. Didn't finish the fight, but he did knock down Peter Yan. It was simple. It was coming out of the clinch. Peter Yan drops his hands. Boom! John Dodson with that big shot with the bit with the big right hand. It's he's just so quick with his hands. He's always gonna find a way to catch. Um, fighters, and this is what I'm gonna talk about in a second here when I make a prediction. But um, Peter Young fight loses that, and then most recently, man, perfect example, Nathaniel Wood. So Nathaniel Wood, great ground ground expert, was winning that fight that entire way over on Anderson Blakovich two in uh, Rio Rancho, New Mexico. Uh, Nathaniel Wood's winning that fight, and then here comes the third round, like 16, se 10 seconds in, man. John Dodson catches him with the right. Like, it, it coming out of the clinch, again, Dodson's so quick, you can't expect it, so boom, got him with the right, and he finishes off Nathaniel Wood, one of Nathaniel Wood's only losses, I do believe. So yeah, John Dodson is, given the record, 21-11, but he's still a very talented fighter, and he can definitely knock off anyone at anyone's best day. So, his opponent, though, Marab Divashili. So, Marab Divashili, in my opinion, should be on a theater right now in the UFC. Comes in the UFC, right, he's 7-2. Fights Frankie Signs first. He loses by split decision over in Fresno and Swanson Ortega. Okay, I thought Marab won that fight. I thought he beat Frankie Signs. He out wrestled him, out worked him, but they gave the win to Frankie Signs. Okay, second fight in the UFC: Ricky Simone, Barbosa Lee in Atlantic Atlantic City, New Jersey. That's such a weird fight. Go watch it. Um, Kenny Florian and um, John Anik do a podcast, right? And they talked about this fight. I think the weekend or like the day after the Marab and Ricky Simone fight happened. So. Um, Marab gets a takedown, a minute left, he's winning this fight, he, he's, so, the final judge of scorecards, he won the fight, but we'll talk about how he really didn't win the fight, so, Marab gets a takedown, takes, um, Ricky Simone down, alright, there's about 50 seconds left, on the takedown, when Marab's going down, it kind of hits his head on the mat, so it kind of stuns him, but, um, Ricky Simone puts the guillotine in, right, he has him, but Marab, it, it, Marab's in the submission, in the choke, for about 50 seconds, but he's staying in the fight, like, you can tell that he's still conscious, right, so the, the 50 seconds goes by, Marab's okay. He when um, when Simone first le lets go of the hold, right? Marab's kind of just stuck on the ground, like he doesn't really do anything. But then as soon as like Ricky Simone tells the referee he's out, like Marab pops right back up and starts like talking talking back at him. I don't know. It's a really weird scenario. Go watch that. Um, it, just go watch that breakdown by Florian and Anik. Um, but yeah, so it was if the judges had this fight for Marab Divashili, it was supposed to be a split decision win for Marab. But the referee sees that Marab is just not doing that well, even though he was he was really like he was into it, but the referee calls it off. It was a really weird stoppage, just a bad stoppage. So they they gave the win to uh, Ricky Simone like 30 seconds after the round ended. Like Fox Sports, they went to commercial. Like it was um they put on the screen up next, the official decision brought to you by Metro or whatever, like the hell they had. Right? So we were going to decision and then we come back from break and the fight's over. 
they they give the win to to um Ricky Simone. It made zero sense. It's a really weird fight. So I think at this point in time, Marab Divashili should be 2-0. Then they give him Terry on where. I mean, Marab's just such a good wrestler. It, it's, this is how Marab fights. Constant pressure, constant pressure, constant pressure. He's not gonna finish guys a lot, but he's such an amazing wrestler. He's just gonna keep taking people down, keep taking people down, keep taking people down. Um, Brad, beat Brad Katona just destroyed him. Casey Kenny destroyed him too. In his most recent fight, fought uh, Gustavo Lopez um, at, at a catch weight, 140. Gustavo Lopez took that fight on really late notice because Marab Divashili was supposed to fight Ray Borg. Borg no longer with the UFC, just got released, unfortunately. But Marab just destroyed Gustavo Lopez. He's so good on the ground, and he's gonna throw a spinning back fist all the damn time. You know why? Because he got a knockout with that. Um, on Dana White looking for a fight, I believe it was that one on Dana White looking for a fight. Um, it was in Ring of Combat in Atlantic City, Georgia, and he beat Rufian Scott. Yeah, that, that was the fight on um, Dana White looking for a fight. He's um, a Matt Serra guy, and Matt Serra will yell like a hundred times during each fight, come on, Marab, in the highest pitch voice possible. But yeah, Marab caught uh, Stotts with that spinning back fist, and then he got into the UFC that way. Um, and then since then, lost two fights, but then now won four. But yeah, this is going to be an interesting fight, right? Because you got Dodson, who's so quick with his hands, he can always, he's kind of got knockout power, but he's got really quick hands, and he's going to catch people at times. But Rob Divashili is such a good wrestler. He's going to keep taking people down, keep taking people down, keep taking people down. This is definitely the best wrestler John Dodson has fought. For Marab, I mean, it's definitely the quickest opponent he's ever fought, because John Dodson, again, it's just so quick, so it's a really interesting fight. Where Marab has to be careful, though, when he takes John Dodson down, and when they get back up, Dodson always throw that, throws that quick right. He'll always throw it, and it sometimes always lands. That's how he caught Nathaniel Wood. I mean, it wasn't coming off Tatum, but that's how he caught Nathaniel Wood. That's how he caught Peter Yan. So Marab's got to be careful of that. He's got to just keep taking John Dodson down, take him down, take him down, take him down. I mean, I think it's going to be a unanimous decision win for Marab Diyoshile. I think he's going to win. He's just going to keep taking down John Dodson. He's going to win. Might be not, might not be the most entertaining fight, but I think Marab Diyoshile is going to get this win. Might enter the top 15 now with the win over John Dodson. All right, so we've got a battle of two top five, top ten heavyweights. We've got Jarzinho, Biggie Boy, Rusenstrike taking on Sagano, Junior Dos Santos. Let's start with Junior Dos Santos, of course, the former UFC heavyweight champion of the world. How did he get that? Beat Fabricio Verdun by KO. Beat Stefan Struve by KO. Beat um, Crow Cop, I guess, was KO's iron injury, but we'll say it's a KO. Um, beat Gabriel Gonzaga. Beat Roy Nelson by decision. Beat Shane Carwin by, by decision. Look at those names, man. Then they give him Cain Velasquez. It was a Fox card. It was the first ever show on Fox. The whole the whole prelims, like the entire main card and the whole prelims were on Facebook. But one fight was on Fox, and it was Cain Velasquez and Junior Dos Santos, and Junior Dos Santos won that fight in one minute. One minute knocked out King Velasquez and new heavyweight champion of the world, Junior Dos Santos. Then he defends the title against Frank Mir in a fight a lot of people forget about. He beat Frank Mir. He did defend that title once. Then, yeah, fought King Velasquez. And oh my goodness, did Junior Dos Santos take a beating in that fight, man? I mean, if we talk about like long term, da long term damage on your career, that's like a fight you just look at straight away. I mean, and we'll talk about the other King Velasquez fight. Uh, but first, um, lost to, so he lost to Tony King Velasquez, then fights Mark Hunt for the, um, I, no, it wasn't for the, it wasn't for the interim. It was just for a number one contender shot, Mark Hunt and JDS. JDS just caught him, man. Spinning heel kick. Oh my goodness. Off the top of the head, Julio Santos got the job done. And then now, Got that shot against Cain Velasquez again. Went five rounds, man. Cain just beat him up for five rounds and then won the fight with the slam. Finished him on the ground. Cain Velasquez retained the title. And then Junior Santos fights Stipe Miocic, who Miocic had the po at this point in his career had only lost one fight in the UFC, and that was to Stefan Struve. Don't forget about that. Struve has a win over Stipe Miocic. But JDS beat Stipe. Really good heavyweight fight. One fight of the night. Won that 48-47, I do believe, unanimous decision. Then he fights Alistair Overeem. Overeem beats him by knockout. Then he fights Ben Rothwell, which is actually, he won by unanimous decision. Five rounds, won in Croatia. Okay, I know Ben Rothwell right now is not a top 10, top 15 guy. Maybe he's top 15 if you really look at it. But, okay, at that point in time, Ben Rothwell hadn't lost a fight in the UFC. He might have lost one, but he was on a roll. He was ranked higher than JDS. I think Rothwell was three, JDS was four. Crazy stuff. And JDS beat the brakes. Just completely destroyed Ben Rothwell in that fight. And just like that, he gets a title shot a year later against Stipe Miocic because he has a win over Stipe. And Stipe knocked him out in the first round in about two minutes in Dallas, Texas. Yikes. Then he gets popped for whatever from USADA. Then it comes back like six months later that it was a false, it was a false pop. I mean, they 
you saw I got it wrong. You don't see that often, do you? So, JDS gets cleared right away, fights Blugoy Ivanov coming out of World Series of Fighting. World Series of Fighting champion Blugoy Ivanov trains at AKA Judo Santos. Now, it wasn't that impressive, it wasn't that entertaining of a fight. JDS destroyed Blugoy Ivanov. Ivanov really didn't do anything in that fight, and JDS just simply jabbed the hell out of him that entire fight. So, he beats Blugoy, fights Tai Tuivasa. Tai Tuivasa, man. Tai Tuivasa hit JDS with some damn shots. And we talked about JDS's chin. You gotta give him credit for this fight, though. Stuck in there against Tai Tuivasa. Ended up winning that fight in the second round. Knocked Tai down. Then got, got him. He mounted him and just started raining the ground and pound. But this is funny. Tai Tuivasa was throwing shots off of his back when he was mounted. It was crazy. But yeah, JDS finished that fight. Then fights Derek Lewis. Now, this fight, you, I mean... It was only in 2019, man. You've got to you you've got to really look at how impressive of, of a fight this is for JDS. Beating Derek Lewis and the way he did it. Derek Lewis hit him with some shots early in the first round. JDS took them and then right away worked the body, worked the body. He was very careful when he worked the head and it worked really well. He avoided a big towering shot by Derek Lewis and he won the fight. There was points in that fight where Derek Lewis kind of faked him out and where Derek Lewis pretend, pretended that he was hurt to the body. Maybe he actually was, but he still had enough to throw a shot. He faked the body injury. JDS comes in, boom, overhand right. He missed though. And since, and then after that, Judo Santos knew that he could pick, um, pick Derek Lewis apart easily. Won that fight. That was only in 2019. That was only a year ago. It seems like longer. Then, quick turnaround, two months later. Fights Francis Ngannou, who's supposed to be number one contender's fight. And, well, I mean, yeah, Francis Ngannou wins. I mean, it, everyone who fights Francis Ngannou is, just gets destroyed. It's so crazy. All that man needs to do is land one punch. And I think he's he's the scariest guy possibly in UFC history. I'm just going to say it. He is. Then, Julio Dos Santos takes on Curtis Blades in North Carolina earlier this year. Curtis Blades didn't even have to go to his wrestling. He just worked on the feet. And really, I mean, he just beat JDS up for two rounds. It was really tough to see. So yeah, JDS coming off a two straight loss is still number five in the world right now. Takes on though the number six contender in Jarzinho Rusenstroik. So uh, Jarzinho, right, comes in the UFC. Um, he's six and zero with the w wasn't even in Ryzen. It was only his, his only decision win, but did ha does have a win in Ryzen by split decision. Okay, comes in the UFC, destroys Junior Albani. Junior Albani though took him down repeatedly in that fight, and it worked. Uh, so that's something to keep your eye on here. Um, he beat Alan Crowder, which, I mean, Alan Crowder is, I don't even think he's in the UFC anymore. Um, he's famous for having that fight with Greg Hardy, Greg Hardy's first ever fight in the UFC. And yeah, I mean, he, he technically beat Greg Hardy because Greg Hardy need him while he had two knees in the ground. That's, that's incredible. But, um, yeah, I mean, Jarzinho beat Alan Crowder in nine seconds. Yeah, won that, um, in Greenville, South Carolina, in the Moicano, uh, Korean Zombie undercard. All right. Then they give him Andre Arlovsky, It's a big step up. You go from Junior Albani and Alan Crowder to the former UFC heavyweight champion in the world. I mean, it was a while ago, but still, Andre Arlovsky, and he beats Arlovsky in about 30 seconds. Um, over, over on UFC 244, Diaz Masvidal beats him, knockout fight over. Okay, then Alistair over him um, in December is scheduled to fight, I believe it was Walt Harris, but unfortunately what happened to Walt Harris is family. Um, Alistair Overeem doesn't have an opponent, so Jarzinho Rosenstrike, because he took no damage in his last two fights. One's in nine, nine seconds, 29 seconds back to back over Crowder and Arlovsky. Then fights Alistair Overeem, and man, okay, I know everyone remembers that fight for the big knockout at the end where Jarzinho throws that right and Alistair's lip explodes. But Alistair Overeem was winning that fight. He was winning every single second of that fight before that one punch. It's true. Alistair was taking him down, he was beating him on the feet, Jarzinho look, looked exhausted, but somehow he had something left in the damn tank, he threw that right, and sat Alistair over him down, and man, that lip was disgusting. So, you've got to think about it though, if Junior Albani can take you down, Alistair over him did a lot better, and he just kept him down. And I don't know why he let him up for the last minute of the fight. And I don't know why Overeem engaged for that last 10 seconds of the fight. Because he would have won the fight easy 50-45 if, if that didn't happen. But Jarzinho gets the win. And right after, man, he calls out Francis Ngannou. And it's like, I mean, do you really want that? I know you just got that big spectacular, spectacular knockout. But, man, I mean, Francis Ngannou is Francis Ngannou coming off a win over JDS. I mean, that's big, right? When I talked about UFC 249, I just pointed this out. I'm like, dude. Ngannou's gonna beat Jarzinho Rosenstrike. Unless Rosenstrike can somehow counter, get a counter punch in there, Ngannou's gonna win this fight. Because look at the body of work Ngannou has. Look what Jarzinho has. Jarzinho took five rounds to KO Alistair over him. Francis Ngannou did it in about two minutes. Even less, I believe. So, I mean, there's that. 
uh, Francis, all, all, it took, all it took was one punch, which is crazy with Francis, man. It, it's one punch, that's it. Won the fight, landed one on the top of the head. It was over. So, this is something, though, you gotta think about, too. That was in May. We are in August. So, really, really short turnaround here for Jarzino Rudenstroy. Taking on a guy in JDS who, given his chin's not really all that fair, but he's still a real talented fighter. He still's got the high IQ of a really good striker, man. Um, so, for a prediction here, right? I don't know if JDS is just going to go with the Alistair Overham game plan and go for it with three rounds, or, I mean, is he just going to try to take him down the entire fight? Which, honestly, I mean, I know we haven't seen JDS do that, but, dude, it's actually not a bad strategy. Because Jarzino Rusenstroke, or Jarzino Rusenstroke's wrestling is not fair. It is not fair. His ground game is not there. He's a striker. He's going to try to knock your head off with punches. But if JDS can get on top of him, wear him out for, for three three five-minute rounds, the fight's going to be over. Or if he can just, just do that for the first two rounds and just survive the third round, JDS is going to win this fight. And I think that's what he's going to do. So as a pr full prediction, I think JDS is going to win probably a decision. But he could knock him out. I think we could definitely see a scenario like the Derek Lewis fight with JDS. Works the body, works the body, works the body, body, and then works the head. Gets the knockout finish. So we could see that. Um, you know, Jarcino Rusenstroik, I think he's good, but I think the hype was just too much. Because I know, okay, he he beats Alan Crowder, which Alan Crowder not in the UFC. Gets taken down by Junior Albani, but eventually still wins the fight by a head kick. Fights Arlovsky, but Andre Arlovsky, man, is, is in the twilight of his career. He really is. I know he just beat Felipe Lins, but Felipe Lins, I mean, I don't know. Coming to the UFC, he lost to Tanner Bowser. So, I, Lins is not that great, but um, I, I just don't know what happened. He was so good in PFL, though. Um, and then Rosen strike over him. He was losing that fight. He was losing that fight for 24 minutes, and then 50 seconds uh, it, with five seconds left in the round, he, he wins. I mean, I know it's a spectacular knockout. It takes a lot to after you're losing for five rounds to come back, knock that, or land that one punch and knock out Alistair over him. But it, it took him five rounds. And, and then the Francis Ngannou fight. Well, the big thing for me is he's taking this fight so quickly after Ngannou. I, I mean, I know it was only one punch. It was about 20 seconds. But still, you got knocked out by Francis Ngannou. And you took you took damage in that fight. It, it's just plain and simple. So, JDS, I mean, he has... He hasn't fought since January. I know his chin's still not there, but I think I think he's going to have enough to beat Jarzino Rusenstroik in this fight. I'm going to say, final prediction, I'm going to say decision, but JDS can definitely knock him out. And definitely, don't get me wrong, Jarzino Rusenstroik could, could definitely go out there in the first round and just knock JDS out. It, it's definitely a possibility, but for, for me, I think JDS is going to win this fight. Still an underdog right now, so you might want to look at that, but I'm going to say JDS gets this one done. And as for where JDS goes next, I mean, you look at the division, number one, you've got... Uh, the champ, it's Stipe Miocic. I mean, two, it's Daniel, or, well, it was technically number one, it's Daniel Cormier. He's gonna fight. We're gonna talk about it in a second here. Um, and then you got Francis Ngannou. The way I see the division, right, I see Stipe Miocic, I see Daniel Cormier really on the same level. Then you got Francis Ngannou right under them, but he could definitely be on their sa the same level too as well, because look at his last fights. But then you got Francis Ngannou. Then you got Curtis Blades under him, because... Francis has beat Curtis Blades twice, and then I think you got everyone else. I think Derek Lewis is, might be on that same level as Curtis Blades, honestly, and we'll, I really want to see that Curtis Blades Derek Lewis fight. I think that'd be real interesting now because Derek Lewis looks so damn good against Lexi Olenek. But so we got, uh, yeah, you got Blades at three, Lewis at four, Dos Santos at five. Where do you go with JDS? I mean, I guess maybe you can say a Derek Lewis rematch. I think that's a possibility. Um, but I think Lewis is gonna fight Blades, and I think the winner. I think. If Stipe wins, I, I'll talk about that more when, when I talk about the winner of the Stipe DC fight. But, I mean, if Stipe or DC wins, say that both of them retire, right? I mean, then you're looking at a Francis, and I think you're looking at a Derek Lewis title fight. Because they're not going to do a third fight between Ngannou and and um, Blades. Because we've already seen that same result, result twice. I think if we get a vacant title fight, we're doing Derek Lewis and Ngannou. Because the first fight was so terrible, but it's not going to happen for a title fight. And Derek Lewis, make them go five rounds too, and just in case something happens. But it's not going to happen for that for five damn rounds. And Derek Lewis won the first fight against Francis Ngannou. Perfect. Do that fight. JDS, I, I guess, Blades rematch? Oh, I, I guess. Maybe you do a rematch between JDS and Blades, but I, I don't know. I mean, guess number one contenders, but the heavyweight division is in such a weird spot. But yeah, I mean, we'll talk about more Stipe and uh, DC later, but yeah. I don't really know where to go with JDS. You can look under the rankings. Maybe Volkov. Um, if Volkov gets a win, Serial uh, gone, honestly, at 15. Verdun if he resigns. I don't know. But yeah, there's the, the division's so weird right now. The Sugar Show is back. Sean O'Malley and Marlon Chito Vera. Yeah, this is a fun fight. Let's start with Marlon Vera. So he's coming off a loss, right? Last fight, he tried 
going up to Featherweight, lost to Song Yadong on the um, Overeem Harris card. Song Yadong won by unanimous decision. I think the decision was correct. I think Song Yadong did win that fight. Before that, um, fights Andre Ewell gets the job done there. Fights Nolan Hernandez, wins that fight. Frankie Sines wins that fight. He's on a big winning streak, right? He's been in the UFC since um, 2014. Uh, he's tested featherweight and bantamweight before, has noble fights, a win over Brad Pickett, um, win over Brian Kelleher, and a loss to John Lineker are really his biggest fights in the UFC. Former top 15 name, the re only reason I think he's not top 15 right now is because he tried going to featherweight and he lost, so that's why he's not ranked right now. Bantamweight, uh, Marlon Vera, man, he can really do it everywhere. I mean, he's not bad on the ground either. He's, he's good standing, I think that's where he's best at, but he's really not bad on the ground either. He can get submission wins as well, so it's a really interesting clash of styles here, but I mean, the, all the hype in this fight is definitely around the man himself, Sugar Sean O'Malley. The fact Sean O'Malley made flyweight once is absolutely insane to me. I don't know how this happened. 2015, fought um, in Montana. Somehow, one fight he won by, he won when he was at flyweight. I don't know how that happened, but I don't think he can ever get down to flyweight again. But, I mean, just because he's so damn tall before I damn ban him weight. But, um, comes to the UFC, right? On the Contender Series, I think that's the second ever Contender Series. Wins by knockout, first round. He's the biggest star to ever come out of the Contender Series. Um, other than maybe Shabazian, uh, Dan Ige, too. I mean, there's been some big stars coming out of, um, Tenor series, but I think Marley or not Marley Vera, Sean O'Malley is probably the most well known name, and he's there's a good reason for it because he comes to the UFC, wins his for our he wins on the Ultimate Fighter show, wins that fights Andre Suk Sukumoth. I mean, he broke his ankle leg in that fight, he couldn't freaking stand, but then Sukumoth thought, Let me take him down, and Sean O'Malley still won by unanimous decision. Crazy, um. Has two years off because of USADA issues. Fights two years later. Beats Jose Alber Alberto Quinones. Knocks him out the head kick at UFC 248. He's back. And then UFC 250. Fights Eddie Wyland, a, a real veteran of the sport. And Sean O'Malley, man. Walk off KO. Boom, right hand. Sits down. Eddie Wyland gets the knockout of the night. Performance of the night in the process. Sean O'Malley is so good on the feet, man. I mean, it's just, he's he's such a good striker, it's absolutely insane, but Marlon Vera, man, he can put an end to this entire Sean O'Malley hype with a victory here. Do I think he's going to be able to get it done? No, I don't. I, I think Sean O'Malley's going to win. But it's definitely possible, but I mean, I think Sean O'Malley, he's a real heavy favorite in this fight, as he should, because the hype is there, but the hype is real, damn it. I mean, look at the wins. I know Marlon Vera is the best fighter he's ever fought, right? Because coming into this, um... Coming in the Eddie Wyland fight, right? He really hadn't fought an established UFC name yet. Eddie Wyland is that established UFC name. And I know it's not Eddie Wyland from 2014 or 2013, but it's still a solid win because Eddie Wyland has been fighting in the UFC and he's fought a lot of top names. So that, that gets Sean O'Malley ranked. So right now he's sitting at 14, I do believe. Yes, he is. He's sitting at 14, um, right above um, Rocky Vashili. So Marlon Vera is not ranked anymore, but he's really a top 15 name. He's just not ranked because he went up to Featherweight once to take on Song Yidong, really tough fighter there. Um, so yeah, I think Sean O'Malley's gonna get the win. I'm gonna say knockout in the second round. I think that's how he's gonna get it done. Um, I, I mean, I, I hate to just take Marlon Vera completely out this fight, but I don't think he wins. I think Sean O'Malley's gonna continue winning. He's gonna go to 13-0. It's gonna be a big win for him. Now, where does he go for this, right? Because with the win here, you're assuming he probably goes up. I mean, I don't know. I think he goes up maybe two two spots i mean i don't know it depends on the marab fight because marab if marab when he's marab wins john dodson's gonna fall down so i think sean o'malley could potentially get up to like number 11 in this fight so he's gonna be looking at the top 10 here looking for a way to get in um the names in the top 10 you've got let's we'll start from the top you've got peter yon the champion marlon marais aljamay sterling who should be challenging peter yon next yeah cody garbrandt who's going down to flyweight to take on divas and figure it out i don't know how that happened but whatever it's fine uh, and then you got Corey santigan who is fighting marlon marais you got pedro munoz you got jose aldo you got jimmy rivera you've got rafael sunsau you've got cody stamen and then you got rob font and you got dominic cruz at 11 okay Sean O'Malley's not fighting Dominic Cruz. That, that's just not a fight Dominic Cruz wants. Let's keep it real. Um, I think a fight for, for Sean O'Malley, Jose Aldo. Do it. I mean, Jose Aldo's coming off a loss to Peter Yon. If Jose Aldo can, wins, can win that fight, that's big for him because he beats Sean O'Malley. But if Sean O'Malley can win, he beats the greatest featherweight of all time. Max Holloway, I know, has a case for that. But he beats Jose Aldo. That's a big fight. Dude, that could potentially made a bad paper for you. I'm just saying, if crowds are back, I don't think they're, they're going to be for Sean O'Malley's next fight. But say they are, put that in Brazil or something. Oh my goodness. Jose Aldo, Sean O'Malley. That would be an incredible fight. And I think that's where you should go with the win here. I'm picking the sugar show. I think Sean O'Malley gets it done by knockout. All right, it is time. It is time for the main event 
of the evening is the trilogy, the third fight. It's the fight to determine the greatest heavyweight of all time. Daniel Cormier and Stipe Miocic. Oh my goodness. Let's start with DC. Of course, the wrestling background. We'll talk about more of his fight strategy really in the first Stipe fight and the second Stipe fight in a second. But let's just go through his career, man. In Strike Force, right? He's a replacement in the damn Strike Force Heavyweight Tournament. This is when Strike Force was was about to go out of business, right? They're about uh, the UFC was about to just overtake everything, right? DC is a replacement fighter. I don't remember who he replaced. Was it Alistair Overeem? It might have been. I think it was Overeem. I I think he replaced Overeem. Overeem gets hurt. He comes in. First fight. Uh, it's supposed it's it's Bigfoot Silva. Bigfoot Silva was on a roll at that time in Strike Force. He's beating everyone. DC comes in there and he knocks out Bigfoot, winning in the semifinals. And then he goes in the final, faces Josh Barnett, who's on a roll at that point too. And Daniel Cormier beats Josh Barnett to win the Grand Prix and win the final ever Strike Force Heavyweight Championship of the world. So the UFC, the UFC now goes. To our the strike force now combines with the UFC, right? Fights Frank Mir gets the win. Fights Roy Nelson gets the win. Goes down to light heavyweight because he would he wouldn't fight at heavyweight for the heavyweight title. He was basically like number two in the world because he beat Frank Mir and Roy Nelson. He was already number two in the world. The problem is, Cain Velasquez was champion. Of course, both of them train both of them train at, train at AKA, so they wouldn't fight each other. So Daniel Cormier instead instead goes down to 205, right? Fights Patrick Cummings. Patrick Cummings wasn't supposed to be in the UFC. Dana White found him at a Starbucks, and he went in, fought DC. DC, of course, gets the job done, but Patrick Cummings is now a long-term UFC fighter. Then he fights Hendo, gets the job done by Rear Naked Choke, and then the first John Jones fight. Wow. Um, it was the biggest competition at that point for John Jones. Yes, he had the Alexander Gustafson fight, but Daniel Cormier was a real threat. He was undefeated at the time. He was 15-0, never lost. John Jones beats him. 49-46, I think 48-47 and 49-46. John Jones gets the job done by unanimous decision. Fight of the night, loses the light heavyweight championship of the world. Then he fights Anthony Johnson for the vacant light heavyweight championship of the world because, of course, John Jones gets into the hidden run. Every, all of that happens. So DC fights Anthony Johnson. DC gets the job done, wins by Rune Kachoke. It was a really interesting fight, right? Because, I mean, Anthony Johnson looked like he was in control for the first round, but DC just took over, took him down, got his back. Then he fights Alexander Gustafson. Incredible fight. Gustafson at a point had that fight won in the fourth round, but DC came back and DC won that fight by split decision. So damn close was Gustafson to finally winning that belt. Then DC is supposed to fight John Jones for the for the light heavyweight championship of the world, but then I think at UFC 196, no 96 was Connor, 97 I believe was Jones OSP. It ended up being Jones OSP because DC got hurt, so OSP steps in. John Jones beats OSP. Then UFC 200, it's supposed to happen, right? John Jones versus DC in the main event, and John Jones test positive again. So Anderson Silva comes in. DC just out wrestles him for three rounds, but this is a moment I remember dearly. With about 10 seconds, 10 or 5 seconds left, the fight stands up for like the only 10 seconds is in this entire fight. Silva catches DC with this nice liver shot. Catches him, stumbles DC for the last 10 seconds, but then DC takes him right back down, and then the fight's over. I just want to mention that. Anderson Silva did catch Daniel Cormier in that fight. Then UFC 210, um, Anthony Johnson's last fight. I mean, I think he's coming back now, but at this point, um, DC is losing the fight. First round, Anthony Johnson is destroying him, and then Daniel Corm, and then Anthony Johnson I think, took the fight down, I think it was, and then DC won. It was such a weird fight. It looked like Rumble just kind of gave up in the second round. It was a really weird fight. And then, here we go. UFC 214, Jones, Cormier, it finally happens, the rematch, and yeah, I mean, DC wins the first round, Jones wins the second round, and then, boom, the head kick by Jones in the third, finishes the fight. And, I mean, after the fight, man, John Jones said, it's over. It's over. It looked like there was respect between Jones and DC, especially from Jones' side. And it looked like, I, I mean, I don't know, maybe DC, that was the end for DC, because really he lost to John Jones twice at that point. And then John Jones tests positive. I mean, there's some great stories about this told by um, Daniel Cormier himself. Uh, Ariel Hawani, too, talked about how... Uh, DC, at, he called DC when DC finally just got over the loss. He was on vacation, and DC didn't want to hear any of this, that he was the champion again. So he's reinstated as the champion, beats Vulcan Uzdemir, then decides to go up and fight Stipe Miocic. I'm going to talk talk more about those fights in a second, but yeah. Um, DC beats Stipe, 
Then fights Derek Lewis, takes him down, works the back, gets him pretty easily, and then loses to Stipe Miocic his last fight. We're going to talk about those two fights in, like for a damn while in a second here, but let's now talk about the career of Stipe Miocic. So, currently, I would say the greatest heavyweight of all time, but it could all change if DC gets the job done this one. So, Stipe, um, tough road in the UFC to start, man. Loses to Stefan Struve, then beats Roy Nelson, though, then beats Gonzaga, then beats Maldonado, then loses to JDS. So he's on a losing, or he loses that fight to JDS. JDS gets a title shot. Um, then Stipe beats Mark Hunt, beats Andre Arlovski, beats Fabricio Verdum for the title in Brazil. The classic fight where uh, Stipe Miocic ran up, hopped the fence, told his corner, I'm the UFC champion of the world. I'm the champion of the world. Incredible moment, man. And Brazil hated that. <laughs> um, and then uh, Stipe beats Overeem in Cleveland, his hometown. That's the classic. He tapped, I uh, got the guillotine, and I clearly felt the tap. Alistair over him. They shouldn't have interviewed him. That was terrible. But um, then he fights JDS, wins that. Francis Ngannou fight, man. So, this fight. Francis Ngannou was hyped up so much coming in this fight because he's beating Alistair over him. He's beating all these top guys. And this is the classic pre press conference where Dana White, while Stipe's on the damn stage, Francis is right there and Dana's reading off, off his damn teleprompter. Uh, so yeah, uh, Francis Ngannou has the, has, has, the power, has the punching power of a Ford Escort. What? I mean, yeah, I get it. The dude punches up. We don't have to tell us that. And there's a body armor thing. There's like the body team body armor for the UFC. It's Cody Garbrandt, Cynthia Calvillo, Michelle Waterson, and Francis Ngannou. When they're at that um, press conference, right? John Annick's bringing them all in. Uh, Cynthia Calvillo, top 15 contender, right? Cody Garbrandt, champion of the world at the point. Michelle Waterson, top 10 um, strawweight as well. Former Adam White champion at Invica. They didn't say that, but she is. Um, when they introduce Francis Ngannou, they say the future heavyweight champion in the world while he's got the fight with Stipe lined up. I don't get it. Given at this point in time, it looks like Francis Ngannou is eventually going to win the belt, but there are no sure things in sports, in MMA, nothing. There's nothing, even in sports, man, there's nothing for sure. I mean, hell, people thought Anthony Bennett in the NBA was going to be a superstar. I, it's just, you can't predict these things. So, uh, yeah, Stipe takes some huge shots in the first round, though, by Francis Ngannou. Ngannou's throwing everything in the first round. That's what he usually does. Every damn shot, Stipe eats those damn shots, takes the fight down, and just take and completely takes over the fight. I think one judge gave one round to Ngannou, but the rest of the judges had a 50-45. Stipe destroyed him on the ground, elbow, 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 inside control, and wore out Francis Ngannou. Really gave the game plan on how to beat Francis Ngannou. So that's why it's interesting, the winner of this fight against Francis, but we'll talk about that later again. Okay. Then the DC fight happens. Loss, loss. Okay, let's talk about these two DC and Stipe fights in full. So, the first fight. All right, July 7th, 2018 at the T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas, Nevada. DC's coming up for the first time at heavyweight. First fight heavyweight in a damn long time. His last fight um, at heavyweight up to this point was uh, against Roy Nelson in 2013. All right, comes up, fights Stipe, pokes him in the eye. S Daniel Cormier, over th these last two fights with Stipe he's adapted a really like a, a new style of him fighting really he puts both of his hands up and he really just loads back from there and punches it's a really weird style but it's it worked for him it really worked for him and with him putting both of his hands up he leaves both of his hands and all of his fingers exposed so he usually I mean he's gonna tend to poke people in the eye that's what we need to see and that's why DC's kind of known now for being a guy who pokes people in the eye kind of like John Jones it's interesting how that happened but yeah Stipe gets poked in the eye, and then a minute later, DC, they're in the clinch, right? They're in the clinch. They break. Stipe drops his right hand. Boom! DC catches him. Fight over just like that. DC, after the fight, should have never said. She should have ne He should have never said that Stipe drops his hand because there's a damn, well, there's a damn good chance that Stipe's camp does not pick up on that in the second fight. He does the same exact thing. But, um, then that's the classic. Brock Lesnar, get your ass in here. And yeah, they had that whole thing with Brock DC. We thought for the longest time, six months, that we were going to get DC and Brock Lesnar. I'm going to keep it real. I was excited for that fight. I just really was. But never happened. So DC fights uh, Derek Lewis. Then the second fight. Stipe DC 2, UFC 241 in Anaheim. Anaheim is so bad for AK, man. I mean, they just they just always lose there. It's so weird. But um, yeah, DC and Stipe, DC's winning the fight. He's just doing the same thing, both hands up, punch, 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 really connecting. All right, he wins the first three rounds, but there's a point in the third round, and in the third round, when you can see Stipe, and you, you're kind of thinking, he can win this fight. He's coming back, DC's gassing a little bit, and Stipe, in the fourth round, just found an opportunity, because DC's got both of his hands up, looking for a shot, 
Boom, uppercut to the body. Another uppercut to the body. Another one, another one, another one. And that's how Stipe won. Worked the body. DC was not defending it. He wasn't dropping his hand because he had both of his hands up trying to headhunt. And yeah, Stipe kept working the body, working the body, working the body, and knocked DC out. TKO finish for Stipe Miocic. Stipe is getting the belt back. And he won that fight. Something to note, though. DC in these two fights with Stipe really did not use his wrestling. In the first fight, uh, the second fight, in the first round, DC got that big, uh, he got that big takedown, right? He had, he held Stipe up, he dropped him on his head. Really good takedown right there, really good wrestling shown by DC, and that's where he's, fr he's, he's an Olympic wrestler, right? But he didn't use it for the rest of the fight. He kind of thought he's just a better boxer than, D than Stipe, which really, he's not. I know DC's stand-up game has improved, but he's not a better striker than Stipe Miocic at all. He's just really not. And he tried to do that for the, the rest of the fight, and Stipe, Stipe made him pay. Got him with the uppercut to the body, and that's how he won the fight. Okay, in recent interviews, Daniel Cormier has said that he's worked on it. He knows now that if Stipe goes to the body, he's going to counter that thing. Is that gamesmanship? I don't know. And then D another thing DC said, though, is that this fight's not going to be entertaining. I'm just going to take him down to smaller, smaller octagon. We're in the apex. I'm going to take him down, and I'm going to drag him for 25 minutes. It's not going to be a fun fight, but that's what's going to happen. I'm going to win by unanimous decision. I'm going to win 50-45. I'm just going to dominate wrestling. You can't underrate the wrestling Stipe Miocic, right? Like, kind of how you can't underrate the, the stand-up game for DC. You can't underrate Stipe's wrestling, too. So, DC saying he's just going to walk in there, and he's just going to go right through Stipe wrestling. Could that be just trying to say something, trying to send a message to the, the Stipe camp? Definitely. Very definitely that could be a thing. But Daniel Cormier thinks, man, I beat this man for I beat this man for 25 minutes over two fights. Uh, he can't beat me. He's not going to beat me in this third fight. But Steve Miocic also thinks, well, the first fight was a fluke. Both guys think they're better than the other. It's a classic fight. It's it's the best, the biggest heavyweight fight, the biggest fight, honestly, of all time in the UFC. All right, my prediction, though. I'm going to see Miocic. Yeah, okay. DC, this is probably going to be his last fight, unless a John Jones fight happens if he wins, but we'll talk about that. Um, I think Steve is going to win. Um, I, 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 I don't know. This fight could truly go either way, though. This is the, like, it's, the odds are even, completely even right now. Minus 110, minus 110. It's a pick'em fight. It's a toss-up fight. I don't know who's going to win. I, I'm going with Stipe just because he won the last fight. And I, I think Stipe has got more left in the tank than DC. DC's coming off that loss. All right. He's 42, I believe now. Is he 40? He's either 41 or 42. Let me check this. He is, oh, he is um 41 years old, right? Stipe's 37. So still both guys are older, but I think Stipe is going to win. He's going to work the body again. He's going to work the body, work the body. I'm going to say he knocks Dan Cormier out. I don't know how, but I think he does. But definitely, if DC somehow just comes out there and now wrestles him for five rounds, which is definitely a possibility, I wouldn't be surprised at all. I wouldn't be surprised with any outcome in this fight. This is truly, like, they're one-to-one. -one. It's like, they're, you don't know how this fight is going to end. No one knows. It go either way. It is the biggest toss-up fight, honestly, ever. All right. The winner of this fight, I'm not going to... I'm really... I mean, I, it could be either of them. I think DC with the win potentially retires. I think Stipe with the win potentially retires. But if both of them stay active, say the winner stays active, um, you got to think John Jones, possibility. you got to think Francis Ngannou, possibility. And I hate to mention it again, but you got to think Brock Lesnar. It, it, I know Lesnar really has not shown interest in fighting, but you got to think that they're going to want Brock Lesnar back. I think it should go to Francis Ngannou. I'm not saying I think I think that Brock Lesnar is more deserving of a shot or John Jones really deserving more deserving of a shot than Francis Ngannou. It should be Francis Ngannou no matter what. But, dude, there's so many options here on the table. I don't know if the winner retires. I think DC probably retires no matter what. I think Stipe might retire, but I think Stipe has definitely has a better shot fighting um, with the win here. But he could just say, you know, screw it, I beat DC twice. I'm the greatest heavyweight ever. I don't need to fight anymore. It's such an intriguing fight, folks. I am so excited for this card here on Saturday night, especially the main event between DC and Stipe. The fight could really go either way. It's going to be incredible. And, folks, thank God for watching this hour-long UFC 252 preview and predictions make sure to hit that subscribe button down below we do one of these every single week and we'll be back next week for pedro munoz and frank yeager along with the comey event of uriah hall and joel romero again thank y'all for watching the subscribe button down below for more and mamba forever